My name is Heather Ward, and welcome to my thesis presentation. Before I begin, I would like to thank Dr. Lynn Reeser for my being my advisor and mentor through this long research process. Um, thank you, Jose, for the last couple of years through the MBA program and guiding me. Thank you, my husband, for supporting me and sticking with me and listening to me talk for hours about coffee. <laughs> That's definitely great. So let's begin with the topic for tonight. My thesis examined the role of three general forces that affect U.S. coffee consumption. General economic conditions, consumer behavior, and factors specific to the coffee industry. And the intent of this research was to build a statistical model based on the 1964 to 2010. The agenda for tonight, we're going to begin with an introduction and a brief history of coffee, discuss the problem statements, also look at the 1964 to 2010 U.S. coffee consumption and what that reveals. Go through some research questions and hypotheses as the foundation of my research. The methodology, including the research design and results. And a conclusion followed by implications for further research and any questions you all may have. This research was inspired by not, not only my obsession with coffee, but my interest in the coffee culture, the U.S. coffee culture. Gourmet coffee entered the U.S. market the late 1960s, early 70s. But it wasn't until the 1990s when there was an espresso boom. And Starbucks was on every corner. People would stand in line and pay $5 for their triple upside down caramel macchiato. When 20 years prior, nobody even knew what a caramel macchiato was. So I knew there had to be something more than just what was on the surface of this coffee culture. Dig, I had to dig deeper and look into more of what people are calling the coffee revolution. And I was immediately drawn to the coffee consumer and demand of coffee and the overall coffee consumption in the US. There are many theories and papers and research on this culture, this coffee culture, but there wasn't much on the economics of coffee and combining the consumer, the US coffee culture, and economics together. Coffee is the second most traded commodity, and it brings in $60 billion a year. So I wanted to connect all of them with economics, consumer, and culture, along with the consumption, and to develop a statistical economic tool that could potentially predict coffee consumption. And this would be useful for investors, producers, traders, coffee companies, basically all parties involved in the coffee industry. So let's take a pause and talk about the history of coffee for a moment. Coffee is a plant and a member of the genus called Coffea. And over a thousand years ago, the first encounter with coffee, the legend says, is by an Ethiopian goat herder named Kaldi. And he noticed his goats dancing crazily one day after eating some red berries off a bush nearby. He became curious and decided to try the berry himself and got a burst of energy and started dancing with his goats, which as you can see in this picture, I was able to capture that. Of over 20 species of coffee, there are two consumed worldwide. It is coffee arabica and coffee canifora, also known as arabica beans and robusta beans. And both of these species require a lot of sunshine, moderate rainfall, 60 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit average temperature, and free from frost. The arabica beans grow at altitudes 1,500 to 6,000 feet, and they are more susceptible to disease they thrive in volcanic soil and mostly grow on the sides of mountains, making it harder for the harvesting process. They are higher quality, better tasting, and more expensive. The robusta beans grow at lower altitudes, sea level to 3,200 feet, and they are the lower quality. They taste bitter, but they are more disease resistant, and they can grow in rougher and hotter conditions. And you can find most robusta coffee are in the instant coffees, and used as a filler in supermarket coffees, whereas Arabica beans are the gourmet coffee. And as you can see, coffee grows in what they call the coffee belt, in between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. And you can split up this coffee belt into three different groups, and each group share coffee shares characteristics. So the first, over here in the Americas, it is more higher acidity, and it's a light to medium body. And then over here in the East Africa, Arabia, that would be more of a floral, lower, acidi or, yes, lower acidity and more of a medium to full body. 
And then over here in the Indonesian and Pacific, it's more of exotic, earthy, and a full body taste. And if you are enjoying our coffee tonight, it is actually a mixture of all different, all three regions. Coffee trees grow to about 32 feet tall, but they're pruned to about six feet for the harvesting. They can be productive for 15 years, and the, the cherries on the trees take, take seven months to ripen. And you can see here, the darker red are ready to be picked ripe, and the more green are not ready. So each berry will actually be more, some will be ripe sooner than others on the same tree. There are two coffee beans in each cherry, and the tree produces about 2,000 cherries a year, equaling one pound of coffee. Coffee houses were first documented in London in 1652, and they were known as penny universities. And people would basically come in, pay a penny, and get a cup of coffee, sit there for hours, engage in intellectual conversations and debates. And they began, people began to document what was going on in these conversations and debates. And that became known as the modern newspaper once they published it. So in this economic analysis of US, US coffee consumption, the problem statement is this study was conducted to develop a model through the investigation of a statistical relationship between U.S. coffee consumption, factors specific to the coffee industry, general economic conditions, and consumer behavior indicators based on the 1964 to 2010 experience. The National Coffee Association documented 56% of adults, adults drink coffee daily. And I obtained my data from the International Coffee Association, or Coffee Organization. And they provided an annual coffee composite composition from 64 to 2010. So in 64, it showed 22.78 pounds consumption per capita. But then in 2010, it was 11.79 pounds consumption per capita. So this initially shocked me because I did not expect it to be declining in the last 46 years. So my perspectives changed right away, and I came, the question was, why was there this decline over the last 46 years? And I'll talk a little bit more in a minute about my expectations of this research. And just to show you a graph, you can kind of see the trends here. Over the last 46 years, it, there's a bigger drop down here in the beginning, pre-1980s. And then over in the last 10 years, it's kind of leveled out. It's really interesting. I'd like to see what happens in the next 10 years, because it looks like it wants to start going up. So as the foundation of my research, I came up with questions right away. And the first was, what economic and coffee-specific variables statistically drive the US coffee consumption? Second was, what is the statistical equation model that can be used to forecast coffee consumption? And how is the equation constructed? Third, what can explain the steady decline in the coffee consumption? And the fourth was a question that was established further in my research in finding the price elasticity of US, US coffee consumption. And I came up with some hypotheses. And I want to stress this is before I gathered the data before I knew there was the decline, I had thought the US coffee consumption has steadily increased in the last 46 years. And I had thought the reason for this was the direct result of US gourmet coffee growth. I hypothesized consumer behavior indicators had the most impact on coffee consumption. And specifically, would, I thought it was real disposable income, the unemployment rate, and household debt as the key consumption drivers. The first step in my methodology was to choose my variables. And to organize this, I divided them into three groups. First, factors specific to the coffee industry. Second, general economic conditions. And third, consumer behavior indicators. And then once I got those established, I dove into the extensive selection process with the objective to reach a diverse group of variables. And I needed to obtain data from 1964 to 2010 sample size of 46, no more or no less. And I used resources, resources such as books, articles, association on different economics and coffee. And my final variables, were the sources for them were Haver Analytics, Yahoo Finance, 
U.S. Census Bureau and the Federal Reserve balance sheets. In selecting the variables, it was very important to understand the logic and the expectation of what each variable would have on coffee consumption. And this was very important to keep in mind throughout the whole study and in my statistical analysis. So first in group A, specific factors specific to the coffee industry, retail coffee prices, obviously very pertinent to coffee consumption. People are very price sensitive and the impact in the logic would be if retail coffee prices increased, coffee consumption would decrease. The Starbucks presence was my dummy variable and Howard Schultz bought Starbucks in 1987 and that's when the explosive store expansion began. So 1964 to 1986 was a zero indicating no presence in the market, no Starbucks presence. And then 1987 to 2010 was a one indicating presence. And if Starbucks presence increased, coffee consumption would increase. Starbucks stock price was another means of connecting the Starbucks success to consumption. And they went public in 1992, so anything prior to that was a zero. And then after that was the average stock price for the year. The percent white of total US population. This variable was found inadvertently through looking through different National Coffee Association studies and looking actually the, the age of consumers. But I saw another, another graph that noted that the, the a very high percent of white consumed coffee. So more white people than any other race consumed coffee. So I wanted to look a little bit more into what the percent white of total population has been doing alone and then correlate it with coffee consumption. In group B, general economic conditions, the real GDP per, per capita decided to use as a way to understand the overall health of the economy. And if real GDP per capita increased, then coffee consumption would increase. The industrial production index was measuring the manufacturing sector. And if that increased, coffee consumption would increase as well. The yield curve was monitoring the US government securities market. It's the 10-year treasury minus the federal funds rate. And the steeper the yield, the healthier the economy is. So coffee consumption would increase. And the S&P 500, representing the composite stock price of the 500 largest companies in the US, used to assess the American equity market. If, that was, if the S&P was to increase, coffee consumption would increase as well. For the third group, consumer behavior indicators, the real disposable income per capita, basically the money a person has left after taxes and government fees, if the real disposable income was to increase, then the coffee consumption would increase. Household debt per capita, measuring the mortgages and consumer debt related closely with cons consumption. The larger the debt, the more hindering it can be on someone's financial freedom. So if household debt increases, coffee consumption would decrease. The personal savings, I'm sorry, the household network net worth per capita is household's total assets minus house total debt. And if it is a higher net worth, then it is an increase in coffee consumption. Now the personal saving rate. It's overall income of all people minus overall spending. So if people are spending more, they are likely to be consuming less, spending less. So the coffee consumption would decrease. The consumer sentiment is a measure of consumer confidence by polling houses. And if people are more confident, they're likely to be buying more coffee and consuming more. The unemployment rate is the well-known popular indicator giving a snapshot of the labor market. If the unemployment is to increase, coffee consumption would decrease. Homeowner, homeowner's equity, and this is measured as a percentage of real estate, showing how much people own or have paid off on their home. If this was to increase, then coffee consumption would increase. The non-farm employment, total number of US workers of any business, excluding farm employees and self-employed workers. It's a driver of cons consumer income potential. And if non-farm employment increased, coffee consumption would increase. And lastly, we have...